all of the things that you wanted, all of the things that you wanted for your, for your children may not have come out of the guardian ad litem's mouth. Everything has gone not in my favor so far. Is a judge ever going to overturn or decide against a guardian ad litem's recommendation? There have been plenty of times where a judge has gone against a guardian ad litem recommendation. The guardian ad litem process is a critical component of any custody and placement litigation. There are plenty of landmines you can step on along the way. Tristan, it's, it's fairly commonplace that people freak out when a guardian ad litem is appointed. And it's probably because they don't understand what a guardian ad litem is and what a guardian ad litem does. So let's start there. What does a guardian ad litem do? They are the attorney for the minor child or children. Um, the court will appoint them to, again, look at these best interest factors, there's about 16 of them, and make an assessment as to what they feel is in the best interest of the minor child when it comes to custody and placement. Meaning there's really no point in freaking out. There's absolutely no point in freaking out. It, uh, having a guardian ad litem appointed is the idea that they're a connection between what is happening on party A's side and what is happening on party B's side. They're an impartial party that's going to look at both A and B and see what the commonalities are, see what the difficulties are, and again, make those best interest determinations. They're going to advise the court as to what their findings are, um, and they're going to take a look and see um, you know, how each of, the, you know, each of the parties are reacting with the minor ch child or children. Viewing the guardian ad litem as an asset as a, as, a, as a really critical third party in a case is, is important. Absolutely, so they're going to be a critical element of any uh, litigation process because they're going to be the mouthpiece from party A and party B. This is going to sound like a biased question, Attorney Egan, but I'm, but I'm gonna ask it because I think it's important. Um, when people are unrepresented, they're left, I think, to their own devices and their emotions to guide them. So I'll, I'll ask, what is the attorney's role for her client during a guardian ad litem process? Well, one thing is that we like to prep the person for these guardian ad litem interviews, prep them for the home visit, go through what kinds of questions are going to be asked of them, go through what, again, the guardian ad litem is trying to accomplish. Like you said before, the guardian ad litem raises a red flag or the guardian ad litem has a question or initial information. We're going to want to facilitate that. I want to make sure that the guardian ad litem has a clear picture of what's happening. So I want to make sure that they have all the records that they need. If we need to file for discovery, if we need to file for depositions, if we need to do and get the guardian ad litem any records that they may need, I want to make sure I facilitate having a smooth process there. People either don't know or don't understand the role of a guardian ad litem, or may have plenty of misconceptions about what the process entails. They might believe that the process is biased against gender, or that no one's going to listen to them, or that their thoughts simply don't matter. None of that is true. But if you don't have the process laid out straightforward and true, it's going to end really badly. So when a guardian ad litem is appointed, my understanding is they have a, a number of different tasks within their, within their checklist that's gonna help with their investigation, right? And one of them is to actually conduct an interview with the critical parties to the case. So when does that interview happen? What, what happens during it? So when you have an interview with a guardian ad litem, it usually transpires uh, sometime after the appointment. Um, the guardian ad litem, if you're represented by an attorney, will first, first reach out to that attorney and ask them um, if they're allowed to make contact with your client. They will have a conversation with you. They'll ask simple questions um, as to you know, your relationship with the child, your home, uh, how, how things are, are, are going in your home. What are the difficulties that you have? What are the successes that you have? How does the minor child flourish? How does the uh, minor child uh, maybe recede when it comes to interactions with different parties? And I usually advise my clients that you are going to want to come up with a list of talking points. Sometimes that helps the most because you're going to want to get the most important information out and not so much focus on what the opposing party is doing or what they have done, but the idea to come back and say, these are the things in my home. These are the things that are happening in my home. Um, this is our routine. This is our schedule. And this was what works and this is what doesn't work. And keep it very conversational, but in the same regard, understand that again, this person does not represent you. They represent the interests of the child. 
So it sounds like a, a component of the interview is also potentially a home visit. Yes. Right? What is that? When does that happen? The guardian aligned will schedule that with you. It may not happen immediately, and in fact, sometimes with a guardian aligned with a phone call um, or maybe even a Zoom meeting, uh, they may decide that they don't want to do a home visit or a home visit's not quite necessary. So, as much as this can be fraught with emotion, why is it important to have that outline? One thing you have to take into consideration is, although the court has appointed the guardian ad litem, and the guardian ad litem's best interests are the children, you're also partially paying for that guardian ad litem, mm -hmm. and you're paying for them by the hour. So it's easy to get off script and to want to uh, bash the other party or talk historically um, what is wrong with that person and why they're not a good parent. And what it, it's so incredibly easy to want to fight for your child because you're so incredibly impassioned uh, into that issue. The guardian ad litem isn't so much looking to have a uh, confrontational session with you about everything that your spouse, your ex-spouse, your, your partner, your ex-partner has done. They're looking at how your home is run and how that child flourishes in that home. I understand that one of the critical factors, uh, one of the statutory factors that a guardian ad litem assesses is one party's willingness to support and co-parent with the other party. So it sounds like one of the checklist items would be uh, in conversation about the other party to kill them with kindness. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I think it's important to be able to touch on those points and say what historically has worked and what has not worked, but bringing it back around to the child, understanding those are the child's best interests, what works for that child. When placement pickup and drop off is working, what's not working about it? Um, have those kinds of conversations and keep to the checklist not so much about I hate him, I hate her, I don't like this, I don't like that, but come back into this is what does work in our home and this is how my child does and how my child is successful in their day-to-day -day activities. Now guardian ad litem is appointed as an order of the court, right? That is correct. Well, does a parent have to cooperate with a court-appointed guardian ad litem? It would be in your best interest to cooperate with a guardian ad litem, yes. What happens if a guardian ad litem in the interview process or in the home visit comes up with a red flag, finds a red flag? Either, either the, the home is unsanitary, potentially, um, the interaction between parent and child isn't as smooth as it, as it should be, or the parent, as you just said, is um, maybe bashing the other party a little bit too much, okay? So, there's a, there's a red flag. What can the parent do once, that, once that's reported? If you're represented by an attorney, the guardian ad litem is going to communicate those concerns to your attorney. Mm -hmm. And your attorney is going to get the opportunity to either contact you and to, to give you a heads up that, hey, these red flags were, have been alerted by the guardian ad litem mm -hmm. and we're going to have to address them in some form or fashion. You're not going to just have one interview with a guardian ad litem or one chance to talk with a guardian ad litem. There is the idea that if something was raised, you will have the opportunity to rebut whatever that presumption was. Mm -hmm. You will be able to communicate with them again. You will be able to answer for whatever red flag has been raised. Everything has gone not in my favor so far. Is it even worth going to trial? Is a judge ever going to overturn or decide against a guardian ad litem's recommendations? There have been plenty of times where a judge has gone against a guardian ad litem recommendations. Um, again, that guardian ad litem has a limited time where they're communicating with you, they're communicating with the other party, and they're making their recommendations on all the facts and circumstances that they see surrounding the case. You have the ability to go in front of a judge and say, I don't agree, and these are the reasons why. And sometimes, you know, to think that the guardian ad litem, the guardian ad litem is not a judge. The guardian ad litem is not the final sayer in the findings of all of these facts. The judge is. So if you want to take all of the information that you have and put it out there through testimony, through exhibits, by all means, sometimes people feel better just knowing that the judge heard their side of the story. So let's remember, a guardian ad litem is a neutral third party appointed by the court in the best interest of the child. Having the right attorney within this process matters, not only to lay down the legal framework for the process, but also to protect you from you.